name is Benjamin Willis. After years of researching ancient history, I've learned about some out-of-place artifacts that put our current understanding of human antiquity into question. It would be my pleasure to share some of these anomalies with you. Now it's been proven that the Vikings made it to Newfoundland centuries before Columbus discovered the New World. But did you know that they also made it to the United States? In the year 1898, outside of Kensington, Minnesota, a farmer was clearing his land and removing a large tree when he discovered a large stone entwined in the roots that was engraved with runes. The city of Alexandria screams Scandinavia. Your first hint might be Big Ole, who stands proud at 28 feet tall. And across the street from the world's tallest Viking are artifacts, smaller in size, but perhaps bigger in height. This was the Mora axe found in Mora, Minnesota. Authentic battle axes and Nordic fire steel are on display at the Runestone Museum, along with a history that dates back to when Skull was more than just a popular chant at Vikings games. So much of this is debatable and controversial. Yes. Pretty much almost every aspect of it, except that it weighs 200 pounds. Amanda Syme is the executive director and a bit of an historian when it comes to the museum's centerpiece. The story goes that Olaf Oman and his sons found it while they were clearing land. The year was 1898. Omen, a Swedish immigrant, became the face for the most controversial stone in the world. It was wrapped in the root of a tree, and the date etched on the rune stone read 1362. Sadly, the dispute over whether or not it's real turned the Omen family's world upside down. Even though some organic material tests show that the rune stone was likely there before they arrived. You show me someone who thinks it's real, I can show you someone who thinks it's not, even if they're in the same respective field. I'm going that it's real. I just don't think that guy had the technology to, to do that kind of writing. How would he know how to do that? This is the story of a simple farm the discovery of an incredible artifact that would destroy his family. The debate has become the subject of documentaries, both here and in Scandinavian countries. A Swedish group who has performed authenticity tests is making plans to do a new test on the whetstone that many believe was used to do the carving. The results could go a long way towards vindicating or vilifying Olaf Ullmann. This is the most recent translation from 2009. There are 10 men by the inland sea to look after our ships, 14 days journey from this peninsula. Linguists, archaeologists, and geologists all agree on the translation, but little else. The museum's stance is to let you decide for yourself. It's definitely Minnesota's mystery. We don't know a lot about it. That we have one is pretty special, even if it doesn't date to 1362. It's still a really big important piece of our history here and our heritage here, so it still says a lot about the community. In Alexandria, John Lordson, WCCO 4 News. We have researchers that are adamant about its authenticity and then those that question the authenticity. The first phase was to conduct sort of an overall forensic evaluation and, and, and we did that and we were able to uh, document several interesting things and then there was a second phase that happened a couple years later where I conducted a tombstone study where I looked at the weathering of uh, tombstones in uh, Maine and uh, that had similar mineralogy and a comparable weathering environment which of course uh, uh, I think uh, a cemetery is about as close as you're ever going to come to the environment that the stone was in. And um, what I did was try to document how long it took for certain minerals that had already weathered away on the rune stone, how long did it take for those uh, to weather off these tombstones. And I concluded that process took about 200 years uh, when they started to come off the surface and since they were already gone on the rune stone, I concluded that the weathering must be older uh, than 200 years. And that's from 1898 when the stone was pulled out of the ground. The, the conservative estimate is that the weathering of the inscription puts it uh, no sooner than the, the late uh, 1600s. Well, I think the preponderance of evidence is consistent with it being here, uh, being carved in the 14th century. And since the rock 
is indigenous to Minnesota, which was one of the conclusions we reached from the geologic work. Um, somebody came here that had that knowledge, presumably from somewhere in Europe, and carved the stone, and I believe immediately buried it uh, as a land claim. Then, in the 1950s, this 11th century Viking coin was found in the state of Maine. This coin has been verified as authentic by experts. Brooklyn, Maine, a small town of about 800 people, known by many for producing world-class boats. But to others, it's also known as the origin of one of Maine's greatest unsolved mysteries, the Viking penny. There was quite a bit of public interest. In the 1950s, an amateur archaeologist named Guy Melgren ventured to Naskeg Point in Brooklyn. There, in an area later named the Goddard site, Melgren found numerous artifacts, among them a small coin. And he was not interested in, um, in coins, so he just put a C on his little map and forgot about it for a while. The tarnished silver coin, tinier than a dime. On one side, a dragon's head. On the other, a double cross. Maine State Museum archaeologist Bruce Bork says the chances of finding something so small are almost unheard of. And it's, we're just fortunate that they went slowly enough to spot this as a little bit different. They could so easily have thought it was a penny or a piece of a tin can and thrown it away. Luckily, they didn't. For years, the coin was misidentified as coming from England. Interesting, but not completely unusual. But when the coin was given to the Maine State Museum, experts realized they had something much more remarkable in their hands. It's actually a, uh, a 11th century Norse penny, and that kind of set off a whirlwind of interest. When it was properly identified, it caused all kinds of excitement because were the Vikings here? That excitement followed by skepticism. For years, scientists returned to the Goddard site in search of other Viking artifacts, but came up empty. Unfortunately, at the archaeological site, we have found two other Inuit objects and nothing else that's been Viking. But analysis shows the coin was indeed created in 11th century Norway. With a find this rare, archaeologists now had to determine if it was really found or was it a hoax planted in the site for attention. Those who knew Melgren trust his credibility and say he had no reason to fake the discovery. During his lifetime, he never made an extraordinary claim about the coin. This, I think, speaks to his basic honesty. It was simply a find that he made. Plus, the coin's appearance is consistent with exposure to the elements. Very little real metal left in the coin. It's mostly what we call corrosion products. So it's lain in the corrosive atmosphere of the main coast for a very long time. After careful consideration, scientists agree the coin is a legitimate find. Now the question becomes, how did this Viking artifact find its way from Norway across the ocean to Brooklyn, Maine? The idea that the Vikings could have been in Maine is a really attractive thought. And I think that's one of the things that makes this so exciting is that what if they were here? Back in 1932, Cecil Maine and Frank Carl were prospecting in the mountains of Wyoming when they entered a cave. They were shocked to discover the mummified remains of a miniature human. For the next few years, the mummy was simply a sideshow oddity. But in 1950, Ivan Goodman sent the mummy to Dr. Paul Martin for a detailed analysis. The six and a half inch seated mummy would be 17 inches tall while standing. And x-rays revealed a fully grown skeletal structure and a full set of adult teeth. Native Americans had legends of little people. Could they have been accurate? When Europeans first colonized the United States, they found the land covered with thousands of earthen mounds and pyramids. Unfortunately, only a small percentage still remain today. But back in 1860, while excavating a mound near Newark, Ohio, a small stone box was discovered with this ornate figurine inside. In ancient Hebrew, it was labeled Moses, 
and the sides were etched with the Ten Commandments. They weren't just in Ohio. It looks like they may have visited Colorado also. There is another, perhaps even older, news report in progress, involving a distinctive but long-forgotten alphabet used on the Arabian Peninsula and found at Block Rock and elsewhere along the Purgatoire River in southeastern Colorado. Ali Ahmed Ali Ashari is a researcher, writer, and member of an ancient tribe residing in Oman on the southern end of the peninsula. Ali's ancestors cultivated precious frankincense thousands of years ago in the province of Dofar on the hillsides and mountains surrounding the coastal port of Salala, a strategic old world trading hub. Ali has been documenting rock carvings in Dofar for many years. He spoke enthusiastically about the matching rock art symbols he saw in southeastern Colorado in 2001 when he returned to the state four years later. I came to America. I was invited by, uh, uh, for two days or three days to, by the uh, uh, Brigham Young University uh, people and I did a lecture there and I met uh, Philip Leonard and he took me for about 14 days on his course and his money and he did everything for me. So we went to Colorado and we saw these inscriptions and I was astonished. I mean, I, you know, I was, it was amazing. It was uh, not unbelievable that you find these inscriptions exactly the same as ours, the same characters, the way that they have written it and the same way that our people and the people here have done it. You were astonished by this? Absolutely. I mean, how can I believe that, you know, uh, hand, uh, thousands of kilometers away from our area that the same people or the same characters being found in here? Their meaning at this time is unknown, but the set of 33 characters corresponding to the sounds in the Shari language is a near perfect match. 28 of the sounds correspond to 28 common characters with the Thamudic alphabet and four of the five distinctively Dofari characters are nowhere else to be found outside of Dofar but on the rocks of southeastern Colorado. We believe those five characters represent the additional five sounds in their language and four of those additional characters are perfect matches to four extra characters we find here and the fifth character does not appear to be related. The implications of these finds are mind-boggling. By seeing those characters, those inscriptions, the Colorado ones, and see ours, you never think that, I mean, these are different. Here's yet another tantalizing link. Notice how this Colorado rock engraving of an ocean-going vessel in use more than a millennium ago compares to the rock art of an ancient ship with the same distinctive rigging and hull in Dofar, halfway around the globe. The Egyptians may have been in ancient Colorado, too. There's very few. What, what the people that have seen it, what do they say? Most of them are dead. Ah. Uh, Most okay. of them, like old Joe Finnan. Is that, you... is that private property? Can you go up there now or is that? Well, there's a, the driveway to it now, this road is closed. Okay. Now, if the Egyptians were in ancient America, wouldn't we find more evidence?
The southern portion of Illinois is called Little Egypt and has been for centuries, but no one knows the origin of the term. In 1982, Russell Burroughs may have figured out why. Mr. Burroughs found a cave and it was full of numerous Egyptian artifacts. The Grand Canyon is an amazing sight to behold. But did you know that there is an ancient conspiracy here? In March of 1909, an explorer claimed to find an unusual archaeological discovery in the canyon. The following April, he returned with a team from the Smithsonian Institute, and they announced the discovery of Egyptian mummies and artifacts deep within a cave. No follow-up stories were ever reported and that area of the Grand Canyon is off-limits to the public and most park personnel. Even though the Grand Canyon is a national park owned and paid for by our tax dollars, only about 15% of the park is legally accessible. It is claimed the restrictions are for the public safety, but there are much more dangerous and remote national parks without these restrictions. So what are they really trying to hide? Could it be mere coincidence that the rock formations in the area of the cave are named the Isis Temple and the Tower of Ra? Pre-Columbian visitations are interesting, but we have found evidence that humanity has been on this planet for hundreds of thousands of years. This three-pronged rock has been labeled the Petrodox. It was found by John J. Williams, and it has been estimated at 100,000 years old. So in 1999, engineer and all-around good guy, John J. Williams found something that has become a very important find, known as the Enigmalith. He was hiking in North America when he noticed something odd about a boulder lying on the ground. Upon closer inspection, John discovered that the rock appeared to have three metal prongs protruding from its center. Finding this rather odd like anyone would, John collected the rock up and took it home. Now, it must be said, John J. Williams is one of those endearing characters that is not easily fooled. The Enigmalith, also known as the Petrodox, is still in the public arena. A device that has the undeniable aspect of an electrical component, which ended up embedded into solid granite, stone composed of quartz and feldspar with small traces of mica. 
Williams has received offers up to half a million dollars for the device, but he refuses to sell it. Williams stated that the artifact, however, is available to any researchers for analysis. So far, only a few individuals have taken the time, or the risk to their funding, to study the mysterious object. According to these studies, the petrodox is not an accretion, concretion, pumice, or a fossil. It does not contain any known resins, cement, glues, adhesives, limestone, mortar, or other binding agents. In other words, this baby is an authentic bona fide rock, which a long time ago formed around the electrical component. According to geological analysis, researchers believe that the rock is at least 100,000 years old, which should be impossible when the object embedded in it is of artificial origin. The device has been compared by some researchers to an electronic XLR connector, or similar component. The artifact has a very weak magnetic attraction. Readings indicate either an open circuit or very high impedance between the pins. Williams has not allowed the object to be broken in half for analysis, but X-ray tests have shown that the artifact has a mysterious, quote, opaque internal structure in the center of the stone. Skeptics firmly state, but at a distance, that this 100,000-year-old electrical component is a manufactured hoax, but Williams does not agree and welcomes studies of it. Williams is convinced that he has found a genuine artifact that belonged to an advanced ancient civilization or an extraterrestrial race. He is willing to let researchers authenticate the artifact. This geode was found in California back in 1961, and when cut open, a device was discovered inside. The component resembles a spark plug, and it has been dated at 500,000 years old was the fact that the outer layer of the specimen was encrusted with the fragments of fossilized shells. Also found within the object were a ceramic-like material, badly corroded copper, and metallic objects resembling a nail and a washer. Not surprisingly, this geode, known as the Koso artifact, has gained much notoriety in the Uparts community. Virginia Maxley, the finder of the artifact, claims that she took the object to a geologist and was told by the geologist that it was at least 500,000 years old. X-ray results were published, and they were astonishing. The object did not appear to be naturally formed. No one today can explain its existence. It's what we call their art, where they chiseled at stone, painted on rocks, and scraped the earth. Many of the Indians were accomplished artists, as evidenced by these accurate representations of wildlife. Which makes it difficult to explain these pictures. And from all over the western United States, strange figures that bear uncanny resemblances to spacemen. Could these drawings indicate a connection between the Indians of the American West and travelers from other worlds? Hoping for an answer, we spoke with Preston Monongi, member of the secretive Hopi Kachina Society. The legends uh, definitely uh, tell of the uh, of uh, these spacecraft and people riding in them and uh, uh, making contact with us, which they have uh, several times uh, in, the, in the just in the past, not too long ago. I would like to really go into it more, but I cannot go into it more because of our religion forbids it. And so, therefore, I can't uh, uh, go into it any further than I've already gone into it. Of all the Indian petroglyphs, 
none perhaps is quite so unexplainable as these. No one has been able to decipher them. Los Angeles engineer Charles Ruggles thinks he has discovered the key to the mysterious petroglyphs. These are scientific drawings. They could be taken right out of a physics textbook. They show sine waves, they show triangle waves, they show square waves, uh, they show electromagnetic circuitry, they show switching, they show almost everything that we could think of in a modern electronics and electromagnetic laboratory. These petroglyphs tell a very intriguing story and it's very much worth investigating. The Indian folklore tells about two flying objects that collided in space over Death Valley and one of them fell in Mustard Canyon. The folklore doesn't tell where the other one fell. Now, where these two objects which made forced landings or actually fell, there was damage and someone came to repair them. When these alien people disassembled these spacecraft, they did it in such a way that they could hopefully reassemble them. And as they disassembled it, it was recorded on apparatus such as this or other forms of uh, communication. To the Indians, these symbols which these aliens made were the symbols of the gods and magic to them. And that's why they reproduced them in the area. Back in 1889, when a community was digging a well 300 feet below ground, this small figurine was discovered. Called the Nampa image, it was recovered from strata over two million years old. Professor Albert A. Wright of Oberlin College officiated the figure's authenticity in 1979, making academia's attempts to vanish the out-of-place figure near impossible. Quote, It was not the product of a small child or amateur, but was made by a true artist. Though badly battered by time, the doll's appearance is still distinct. It has a bulbous head with barely discernible mouth and eyes, broad shoulders, short thick arms, and long legs. There are also faint geometric markings on the figure, which represent either clothing patterns or jewelry. They are found mostly on the chest or around the neck, arms, and wrists. The doll is the image of a person of a high civilization, artistically attired. We find his conclusion of it being of a person of high civilization as the most compelling, further supporting our belief that the doll is a leftover remnant of a now lost civilization. The geological strata it was discovered amongst is known as the Glens Ferry Formation, that, according to the same entities that deny the artifact's existence, was created approximately two million years ago during the Pliocene-Pleistocene transition. George Frederick Wright, a geologist from the Boston Society of Natural History also confirmed this astonishing object's authenticity. Quote, there is no ground to question the fact that this image came up in the sand pump from the depth reported. In visiting the locality in 1890, I took special pains while on the ground to compare the discoloration of the oxide upon the image with that upon the clay balls still found among the debris and ascertained it to be as nearly identical as it is possible to be. These confirmation evidences, in connection with the very satisfactory character of the evidence, furnished by the parties who made the discovery, confirmed by Mr. G. M. Gumming of Boston, who was the superintendent of that division, and who knew all the parties, placed the genuineness of the discovery, in my mind, beyond reasonable doubt." End quote. How could a figurine, dated at two million years old, identified as having come from a technologically advanced civilization, exist? Authenticated by a number of official and highly trained individuals, 
if indeed there has never been another technologically advanced civilization. Well, on to a news story today. A tiny figurine found in Nampa has for many years sparked a whole lot of controversy. This is pretty interesting. It's July of 1889. Several men drill for water in what at that time was the very small town of Nampa. Reports say they were drilling down about 320 feet when this tiny clay figurine surfaced. It's the crude figure of a woman, only about an inch and a half long, with what appears to be one leg broken off. It's really fragile. It's really small. Uh, there's nothing like that's ever been found that deep anywhere in North America, let alone in Idaho. The figure, which is now known as the Nampa Image, is housed here at the Idaho Historical Museum. You can see it, actually, if you just call ahead and make a special request. But where did it come from? Some say Native Americans made it thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago, but we may never know for sure. The scientific community of the time spent a lot of time arguing and debating what it was, and no conclusions were ever come to. And even today, experts have no real proof of its age. In 1936, Texas, this hammer embedded in stone was discovered. The handle is in the process of turning into coal, and it is estimated to be 140 million years old. Glen Rose, Texas. This rural southern town has a population of only 2,500, but may hold one of the most incredible archaeological artifacts ever found. The hammer itself was found in the Travis Formation. It's a concretion of sandstone. And it usually takes about 140 million years for this to form. That would put it at 140 million years old. Mainstream scientists contend that the first modern humans emerged only 200,000 years ago. But if so, how is it possible that such an artifact exists? The hammer was scientifically analyzed in the 1980s by two independent labs, the Creation Science Foundation based in Australia and the Battelle Memorial Laboratory in Columbus, Ohio. Incredibly, both labs concluded that the hammer could indeed be over 100 million years old. Part of the handle actually is starting to go through a process called coalification. It's where you have inorganic material and organic material changing into coal. This is something that just simply can't happen in the span of, say, 100 years. Like most people saying, oh, this is nothing more than a hammer that was left behind by a would-be prospector from the mid-1800s. In addition to coalification, the handle of the hammer shows signs of petrification. This process of the organic wood being replaced by mineral crystals takes millions of years. Test results concluded that the material on the hammerhead consisted of 96.6% iron, 2.6% chlorine, and less than 1% sulfur. Incredibly, this material contained no carbon to indicate modern manufacturing. When we were making steel for tools, part of the process is to use a blast furnace to remove carbon out of it completely. But we always have about 0.2 to 2% left over. There's always a carbon signature on our steel, but there wasn't any carbon whatsoever that was found in this particular material. This object may be as old as 140 million years. And obviously, that's a crazy proposition if you think that modern day archaeology suggests that we've only been around for about 10,000 years, you know, creating stuff with our own hands. So this falls into the category of out of place artifacts, artifacts that shouldn't exist. If the London Hammer really dates back to over 100 million years, as the data suggests, this find would have to fundamentally reshape our understanding of human development on planet Earth. When they first discovered it on a piece of new property they had just purchased, they simply saw a rock, concretionary rock, that was embedded in the bedrock. They got it out. There was nothing but a stick sticking out. 
Their son chipped the top of it off. This is a portion of the overlay material. You can see the groove where it fit. Now, the overlay material covered all of it. This overlay material consists of nucleopolysopod shells, which are assigned an age from Silurian to present. And again, that is of no great significance, but the hammer itself is. In the research at the laboratory, they did a streaming microprobe elemental analysis. And they discovered that the iron, the hammerhead, is 96.6% iron, 0.74% sulfur, and 2.6% chlorine. You can't do that. You can compound chlorine with dust particles of iron, but not with a lattice of iron. Whoever fabricated this instrument had knowledge superior to our best physicists of the day. Back in 1851, this bell-shaped vessel was blasted out of solid stone in Dorchester, Massachusetts. It is made out of zinc and estimated at 500 million years old. Dorchester, Massachusetts, USA, in 1852, at Meeting House Quarry, workers were using dynamite to break up the bedrock, when an explosion threw an artifact into the light of day, after spending many thousands of years under the earth. According to geologists, the Roxbury Rock, in which this mysterious artifact was embedded, has been dated as having accumulated between 570 and 593 million years ago, during the Eddie Cannon period. Imagine their surprise, when workers spotted a metallic object amongst the debris of the explosion, still partially embedded in a chunk of rock, and now sheared into two pieces from the forces of the blast. A zinc vase covered in flower decorations painted in solid silver. The bell-shaped pot is around four and a half inches tall and about six and a half inches long, and was noted as being exquisitely made. The age of the vase has been heavily debated amongst specialists, with many struggling to produce ages smaller than 100,000 years. Additionally, the species of flowers and plants that are illustrated upon the vase, also went extinct over 100,000 years ago. The initial discovery was covered on June 5, 1852, from the publication of the magazine Scientific American, which confirms its authenticity, as indeed being found embedded in the solid ancient stone, 15 feet below the surface. In Lake Mills, Wisconsin, is the infamous Rock Lake. Dating back to Native American legends, there have been stories that a pyramid is beneath the waters underneath the lake. The small town has embraced this legend, as you can see. Decades ago, divers spotted a structure, and this image was made. However, now we have aerial photos that seem to show the pyramid beneath the water. For hundreds of years, researchers have been confronted with numerous scientific anomalies. But traditional science is often intolerant of evidence that doesn't fit neatly within accepted frameworks. Because of these prejudices, could we be missing a greater truth about mankind's origins? I think scientists need to look at these things and instead of just dismissing it offhand right away, to be like, wait a second, maybe we are not the first, maybe another civilization did exist, because clearly we have a mystery there, and everybody's looking the other way. I think there are only four possible options. One, humanity's history goes back much further than we were led to believe. Two, time travelers from the future have somehow gone back in time 
and left artifacts. Three, some other species, possibly reptiles, evolved into an advanced society and maybe they left artifacts and we are now discovering them. Four, and this is a popular theory, extraterrestrials visited Earth in antiquity. Personally, I'd prefer to think that human history goes back much further in time than we are aware of. Possibly that's just ego, but that's what I'd prefer to think. Thank you for your time.